Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wrestle Horror. Greetings, listeners. Meet Hook Jim here with Wrestle Horror Podcast, along with my co-host Donnie Hoover. And hey, everybody! Got, how's it going? We've got a special treat for you. We do a lot of the wrestlers. We try to get more of the haunters in, and this time we've got Leonard Pickle the godfather of the haunt industry. Leonard, how are you? I'm fantastic. Thanks for asking. And, you know, we try, you know, we've been trying so hard to, to, to balance out the horror and the wrestling. And sometimes it just leans more towards the wrestling. And having Leonard on this show is going to be great because this man is a wealth of knowledge. If you're a haunter, you need to know Leonard Pickle. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, Leonard, uh, for those of you that those listeners that aren't familiar with you, how did you get your start in the haunted industry? Haunt industry? Well, first haunted house I did was in the college dormitory in, when I was studying to be an architect, and uh, we we uh, just ran it as a lark uh, in the dormitory at uh, Texas A&M University, and we were open for two nights and we charged um, fifty cents a head, and we rose like a thousand dollars or something, which was ridiculous. So it, uh, you know, it was fun. Um, my, I was able to use my, my architectural skills to, to pull it off. And, and um, I did it a couple more times when I was in college. And then when I graduated, I volunteered with the March of Dimes, which was the big haunt in Dallas at the time. And uh, I was apprenticing as an architect, but I was uh, doing the Halloween stuff on the side. And I chaired the March of Dimes haunt for four years. And then I, um, you know, I, I uh, made took the plunge I built a haunted house out of credit cards and pocket change and, and opened it up and ran it for the month and shut it down and then tried to pay all my bills. And I was about $20,000 short. So, you know, I thought that was a total failure, but um, uh, not realizing that a haunted house is a business just like any other. It's not a get rich quick scheme, you know, and it takes three to five years to pay all that out. And, um, I went to a, um, uh, now that I'd started a business, I you know, wish I'd taken business in college, but I did. Uh, now that I'd started a business, I decided I would I probably should go and take a class on, on business. So I signed up at the local um, uh, community college and uh, took a class on how to start a business and, and sat there in, in horror after the, and listened to the guy at the front of the room tell me everything that I shouldn't do to start a business each of which I had already done, you know, don't do it on credit cards, you know, make sure that you're marketing and plan. I mean, everything he's, everything he said is stuff that I didn't do. Uh, But he did at the end of the, at the end of the the class say that if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to start a business then you should be an expert in your field, how do you become an expert in your field? Well, you write a book. So at the time I had a whole stack of, of um, room design concepts that little sketches on, on, um, on what things that I was thinking about doing, things I've done in the past, just a document the kind of room designs that I would use. So I had this kind of library of, of room designs that I'd been doing. And, and so I took that, I turned it into a little booklet and you know, Xeroxed it and, and turned it and comb bound it and put this and put it in this little booklet. And okay, now I've got a book. What am I supposed to do with it? I got to sell it somewhere. So I took out a little bitty classified ad in Fangoria magazine and, and, um, um, you know, I got a few purchases that way. I went down to the library on the Saturday uh, before Halloween and I, uh, the Dallas library had newspapers from all across the country. So I, you know, I took every newspaper I could find and went to their haunted house listing, took all that information down and, and started building this database of haunted houses uh, around the country to, to sell the book to. And, um, you know, that kind of turned into Haunted Attraction Magazine because now I had this, this database of haunted houses. So it came up, a friend of mine called me and said his best way to promote his business was through a newsletter that he mailed out to everybody. So I, so we kind of came up with a concept of, of doing Haunted Attraction Magazine, which started off as a little, you know, four page, you know, almost church bulletin looking thing that we sent out. And that turned into a, a 50 page magazine you know, after doing about 50 issues of it. And, and, uh, um, during that time period, you know, we, we were all about sharing information and, um, and helping people, you know, try to get started, do what they do better. 
So that kind of turned into HauntCon. We started a convention that was, you know, geared specifically for the haunted house industry and, and, um, and took that, uh, ran that for about 15 years before we sold it, sold the magazine, sold the um, HauntCon to uh, some people that knew what they were doing about a convention. You know, we were doing it all wrong, moving around city to city. So we didn't really have any kind of a following. Every, every year was new and, you know, our education was amazing and, and we really did a lot of good things and, and we're because we were, we moved it to a different location every year. We were able to, to see a lot of haunted houses that, uh, that are now kind of defunct. So it was, it was a great time and um, we really had a lot of fun with it, but, uh, but I've kind of sold out of all that. And, and now I'm just doing haunted house design and, and uh, we've really niched ourselves into helping people get started in the industry. So uh, that's, that's who calls me nowadays is it's people that have great ideas and uh, are looking for how to put that in into motion. And that's what I do year round. Donnie, any questions for Leonard? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I have a bunch of questions, but I'm more of a sit back and listen guy, but I do have some questions. And uh, oddly enough, the, the way I met Leonard, because everybody knows that I'm not many years into the haunt industry, I'm more the wrestling side. And uh, I've only, you know, I had the two years where we ran the Trail of Tormented Terror and I went to the Ohio Hunters and Halloween convention last year and uh, Leonard came down and was, he came down there or up there to us and was doing some training and some classes and all that. And we ended up like a bunch of us going to dinner and I kind of sat across from him and that's the world. Yeah. Everybody's just talking. We're just all just having small talk. And then, uh, so I asked Leonard a question haunt, haunt related because I was curious and I'm already wanting to learn. And his reply was, what, are you trying to get some advice for free here or something? Oh, I would <laughs> never have done I just, that. I would <laughs> never have done that. And I, I mean, I thought it was hilarious. I was like, I do like this dude. This dude's awesome. <laughs> so, so, I mean, we ended up, I mean, he answered everybody's questions. Everybody was, like, picking his brain, of course. And uh, and then, uh, oddly enough, the Mohican Haunted House was running that night for people at the convention. And me and my wife wanted to go. And... Uh, Leonard wanted to go, but not too many others. I think one other person went with us, and uh, Sage went with us, and uh, not too many people wanted to go, so we were just like, you want to ride with us? And Leonard was like, yeah, sure. So we jumped in our van and went to Mohican Haunted House, and like I said, I'm still new to the business. I mean, I knew who Leonard Pickle was, but I didn't know he was like the godfather of haunted attraction industry. <laughs> so like when we get in line, there's like the whole line is all haunt industry people because it's, it's for the convention. So I could tell like all these people were side eye looking at us, you know, like, why is Leo with this goober? You know, who the hell is this dude? <laughs> it's like, yeah. But I mean, it was a breath of fresh air to see because uh, Leonard, I mean, it was like watching him. It was like a kid on Christmas morning when he got inside that haunt. And I mean, like he, he, he was teasing my wife and say, saying that they were going to go in first because we like to watch them see what scares them. And he was like touching everything and you just wanted to like smack him on the hand, like quit touching that, leave it alone. <laughs> and he was just like, you know, having a blast, you know, and, and it was great to see. He was talking with the actors and, and having some fun with them. And you could just tell he was just having a blast. And it is nice to see that somebody has been in the business that long, you know, still has that passion for it and has a great time like he did uh but my first question after that long rat rambling on um i read about the pickle theory of haunted houses so i was wanting to know about that <laughs> well it was interesting because as i said i kind of started off with the march of dimes and and i would i had this i had this big stack of notes it was all and it's before you know even word processors much less computers but so i had this big stack of handwritten notes uh when i was working with the march of dimes and um, you know, I was always fumbling through them during the meetings, trying to, you know, come up with concepts or what, what you know, taking, make, taking notes about what we were talking about. And, and one time, one of the staff members with the March of Dimes, you know, saw me fumbling through these notes and she said, would, would you like me to type, organize those and type them up for you? And I was just like, oh my gosh, that would be awesome. So, so I handed her my manifesto, you know, this handwritten scribbled on and, and you know, a piece of several stack, stack of paper. And, um, and so she took it off and a week or two later, she comes back and she hands me this, this typed out, you know, beautiful little you know, folded uh, or, or stapled uh, booklet. Um, and she titled it the pickle theory of haunted houses. And so and I'm thumbing through it. I, you know, I'm just thrilled with this thing. And it was, and the weird thing about it is I, I was very, at the time I was very secretive about what we do. We, there was a room design that we had come up with, 
um, that I've been using over and over. And there was a haunted house down the street from us that had been trying to copy it. They couldn't figure it out. It was pretty funny that they, they kept trying to, every time I went through their haunt, I could tell what they were trying to do. And, and we were in the Dallas March of Dimes and Fort Worth is about 30 miles away from the doubt from Dallas. And the, the, the Fort Worth March of Dimes also had a haunted house. And, and it was, we, the marketing was all the same. We were both on the same posters. We we're both on the same ads. The, every, all of the marketing was the same. And Fort Worth beat us in attendance every year except for one. And so it was always my goal to try to beat Fort Worth. And, and part of it was location. Um, there, there's, there's a state fair that opens in the middle of October um, uh, or runs till the middle of October in Dallas. And, and that kind of guts the market in, until that show's over. So it was always hard for us to get people in early. But, but, um, but it was always my goal to beat Fort Worth. And after she hands me this thing and I'm just, I'm just crying. It was so beautiful. I said, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. This is amazing. And she says, I hope you don't mind, but I sent a copy to the, to the chairman of the Fort Worth March of Dimes Haunted House uh, so that he, so that he could get some benefit out of your, out of your wisdom as well. And it was just like, it was just like stabbing me in the heart. I mean, it's just <laughs> taking this thing, this thing that I was very secretive about and, and just, you know, throwing it out to the world and to my biggest competitor. And uh, until I heard that he wrote, this is stupid on it and sent it back to her. So it was just like, you know, <laughs> that was the last time I was ever secretive about anything that I know. It was the last thing that I ever, that I ever tried not to share because it was like, you know, some people you just can't, you can't, uh, they're not going to see brilliance even when it slaps them in the face. So, right. um, and that's really what, I mean, it really kind of started me down the path that I went on through the magazine and through the convention of, of, and speaking, I speak at every opportunity they give me. I probably speak too much, but, um, but it's, I'm always about sharing because, because, you know, it, if I live in a bubble and I don't share any of my ideas, all, all I do is, is, is live in my little bubble, then you can only go so far. But if I give my ideas to you and you take them and you take something else that you know that I don't and put them together and then I come through your haunt and I see this, it's like, wow, this is taking my idea, but taking it further that allows me to stair step above where I could ever go by myself. So, um, so that's why I'm really big on, on sharing ideas. And then I, I really, really ever, ever since the first haunted house I did, I've always been big about going and seeing everybody else's haunted house, you know, not necessarily to steal ideas, although I'm not about, I'm, I wouldn't stop doing that. <laughs> that wouldn't stop me from, from grabbing a great idea, but, but it's more about finding two things from two different haunted houses that I could put together for the first time and come up with something that's, that's as close to original as possible. Very cool. Yeah, I do, I do remember a couple comments you made when we were going through Mohican that you did sort of like you touched on taking an idea and taking it in a different angle. Right. You could say, oh, that's interesting. I, I never thought of it doing it like that, or that's an interesting way of looking at this. And uh, so I do remember you saying that kind of stuff. So yeah, that, and that kind of learned, had me learn too. Like that's how, what I should do when I go to haunted houses, see, see something I like and see how can I make it my own or how can right. I ramp it up. Right. I, you know, I honestly think you could take my best room design and stick it in the middle of somebody else's haunt and it would not be as effective as it, as it is in my show because you know, the, the flow is different. I, I mean, everybody has a, has a particular way of, of, of doing a haunted house. You know, there's no right way or wrong way. There's, I mean, the way that I do it is, is from years and years of experience of, of failing and doing it wrong so many times that, that I kind of have, have steered, has steered me into the direction of where I go. Um, you know, people, I'm always getting yelled at for being in the, uh, you know, a, a, no, a, a, an obnoxious know-it-all, but it's just because I've, I've been doing it for so long. It just comes second nature to me. And it, it sometimes it kind of stuns me when somebody's doing something that, that, you know, that, that we, we were, we started doing in the seventies or in the eighties and then we abandoned it because there was a much better way. And I, I'll still so, still see people doing it, you know, like going in and building a haunted house by just framing it out like you would a like you would a normal house and then sheeting that with plywood. That's just a crazy idea. Um, the, the only people that I know that do that, that it makes sense for them to do that is people like Universal Studios where they're just going to come in and doze the thing anyway. They don't, they really don't repeat anything that they're doing. But, you know, by building panels instead of by building walls, not only can you now rearrange stuff really easily just by taking it apart and putting it back together in a different format. But if you have to move for whatever reason, you can take it down and store it. You can, you can, you know, have a location that you're doing something else with the rest of the year and then set the haunted house stuff in it, you know, for, for October, for Halloween and then October and then, and then take it down and store it and put it back up again, completely different. So, I mean, it's, it's those kind of things that, that, you know, I thought we, I thought we had decided, 
um, not to do as an industry many years ago that I still see happening. I still see people, you know, framing out uh, metal studs and sheetrock sometimes, which is just crazy. There's no way, you know, you're going to have so many butthole, butt um, dents in the in that sheetrock from scaring people or elbows or just just people going through and being being obnoxious and punching stuff that that it's uh, it's it's really um, uh, the hard way to do it. You know, everything should be panelized, and, and the panels that I use are only two inches thick, so they even they even store in half the size that a normal normal studded wall would store in. I just a lot. I mean, I just and if you want to do it, like I said, Universal does it the other way, and it makes sense for them. But in most cases, you know, the way I the way I've come up with the all that stuff is is just out of out of doing it wrong once and saying and being bullheaded and saying no, that wasn't wrong. I'm going to do it again. And then on the second or third time I tried it, it's like you know maybe this isn't the great idea that I thought it was. Maybe I should I should uh, do it a different way. And and as far as the pickle theory, I mean, really the pickle theory boils down into a, a, a scare forward, high capacity attraction. Um, you know, all the scares, uh, I always do something to, to put something between the actor and the patron to protect both from the other. I never want them to interact. I don't do a lot of hand props for that same reason. I, you know, if you give, if you give an actor something in his hand, he's either going to hit himself with it. He's going to hit somebody else with it, or he's going to hit the wall with it. And I don't want any, any of those to happen. So so I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, unless it's some really cool character that's out of the, that's entertaining the queue line or something like that, a roaming character outside, I'm not going to give him much to do except to pop out of a hole and scare the crap out of people. Nice. Well, that was kind of sort of uh, led into my next question. Um, you do a lot of the scene design and all that. That's what, that's where, that's your bread and butter. What is your, what do you think is more effective? Is it, do you do like uh, a lot of gore or not a lot of gore? Do you do uh, like, scares just to make people uncomfortable or jump scares or what do you think is the most effective out there yeah i the and th another part of the the pickle theory was uh, it was high startle and low gore um you know even stephen king and his some of the writings about what the books that he's written he has stephen king has a couple of books out about about how he writes not it's not they're not novels they're actually you know helping you know budding writers learn how to write like he writes and he even he says that the only time that he goes to gore is when it's when he can't go anywhere else. He, he only kind of calls it a cop out. You know, it's an easy reaction that you can get out of people. And and the problem that I see with people doing gore in a haunted house is the very first room has got bloody body parts on it. Every room after that has bloody body parts on it, and the last room has bloody body parts. You know, before long you're so numb to that it doesn't matter. If I do gore, you know, the first half of the haunt or even more than that is 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 going to be pretty darn clean, and then you know, the last room is just going to be dripping in blood so that, so that it has more impact than it does if you just got, you know, body parts and, and dead people throughout the whole show. Um, kind of like a slow build type of thing. Exactly. I do a lot of stuff to build up. I, I even do, I always do a little bit of dark hallway between each room in my designs because I want them to kind of reset and get set up for the next room. You, you, can, you can scare people, scare people, scare people, scare people, but pretty soon you're at a diminishing return. Sometimes I like to do something funny, sight gag or something to make them laugh and then start scaring them again. So, but I always give a little piece of, of dark corridor between the room designs and I make those hallways longer in the beginning and very short at the end, again, to accelerate that, that, that the, the capacity. I'm actually, you know, I'm actually chasing people through the haunted house. Again, everything is scare forward. You know, you scare them from the back, from both sides, the top and the bottom but you don't want to ever scare them in from the front because then you stop them. And if you stop them, you're going to have, you're going to bottleneck yourself out to the parking lot. You, you really want to push people through the haunt as fast as possible. Right. So that you can get some more in and get some money. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I wanted to say haunt con, uh, you know, it is known for its education. I was fortunate enough to teach at Pittsburgh back in 2012 I actually ended up teaching two classes there because somebody uh, didn't show up. Uh, but uh, it, it is always, you know, people always used to complain back in the day, well, Hong Kong's so much more expensive to get in, but the level of education that you get from Hong Kong is more than worth the admission price. Yeah, that was, that was a concept that I came up with very early and probably again was a mistake in, in that, I didn't think it was fair for the exhibitor to spend to, to pay for the room. You know, the way, the way, you know, a, tra a trade show that's free to get into 
is you're, you're asking that vendor to pay for the rent of the space. Right. My concept was let's spread out this, this cost among everybody and then, and then not only give them the trade show, but give them the education because you really want as you know, from a, you know, from an industry guy and I want everybody to take the education. I, I want everybody in, in the, in the room to do the education because the education is going to make you better at what you do. You're more efficient at what you do. It's going to, it's going to make you make more money so that you can spend more money in the trade show floor, you know, and come back to my convention again. So my model was to, um, to charge everybody a low fee and then I'll include the education as well as the trade show in that, in that part of it. I'm, so I'm surprised that you say that we were more expensive to get into, but you're right. I mean, we weren't free. Midwest Honors Convention was free and then they charged for the education. And right. that's the way Hon that's the way HonkCon is now as well. Um, HonkCon is basically free to get into and, and then they charge for the education. I still don't like that model. Uh, I would rather have everybody pay a little bit and then make the education free because the education, you know, and yeah, it's hard to get up in the mornings to go to those classes and it's, and, you know, sometimes you'll go into a class that's, you know, that's more self-promotional than it is educational, which is always uh, awful. But at least at Hong Kong, you can get up and move to another room. You know, at right. the other shows, you know, you might have paid 80 bucks to go into a seminar and it's totally self-promotional and you don't have the option. You're stuck because you don't, you can't just get up and take your wristband and go into another class. You're, you're stuck with that, with that speaker. So. You know, it, it um, education has always been, you know, and again, it's all, it's all about sharing information and education has always been, I mean, I've always been really big on that for that very reason, because uh, I think that helps everybody. And, and again, I, I'll share anything that I know. There's not anything that I, that I hold secret anymore because, you know, it's, and, and hopefully it's so funny. And when I do, every time I do a seminar at the end of the seminar, I ask for questions and it's just like crickets, you know, you can't, there's not anybody raising their hand or anything. It's just like, so I've either totally baffled them with bull or, you know, or I've, or I've explained everything in such detail that they know absolutely everything that I know. And I know that's not the case. So, so it's, it's pretty interesting. It's almost having to pull questions out of people at the end of a class. And I think it's because I include too much in a, in a seminar. You, they, you go to these, these places on how to teach you how to do a seminar. And, you know, they say, oh, so, so here you should, you should do five main points in your, in your seminar. And I'm looking at my outlines with, you know, like 35 main points. So, it's just like, so I'm, I'm probably just cramming too much, so much in that they'll, they'll never, re, they'll never be able to retain any of it. Well, you know, I've, uh, the last time I went to Hong Kong was in New Orleans back in 2018 and uh i took a, a class on eva phone right and i thought it was fantastic yeah i mean we got to work with it and, and learn a little bit how to work it and and that's one thing that i've always wanted to do is you know how, how do i make armor on the cheap and that's a great way to do it yep uh any kind of education which hong kong has always provided superior education in my opinion uh I for agree. the money for the money, superior education. Mm -hmm. No, that's, and that's what we've always pushed for. And one of the, mis another mistake that I made is, you know, our, our education was stellar and everybody was really raving about it, but we really took it to a level and, and we never really got, you know, we never really, really went past that. So, so we educated the industry up to that level and then we never really offered them anything above that to come back to. And that's what we've been trying to do in the last two or three years that, at uh, at Hong Kong now is is really up that experience level so that a guy that really feels like he's you know pretty solid on the basics can still learn some stuff um, at uh, if he goes to if he goes to Hong Kong now um, I'm always trying to do advanced classes there and and you know take it up to the next level um, so it's and, and and that's because we we we've, we've got to bring those big guys back we've got to bring the people back that loved us originally because we taught them everything they knew and then, right. uh, but then kind of let them hang because we didn't go to the next level. Okay. Donnie, do you have another question for Leonard? Um, just kind of a basic question. I'm sure you've been asked a million times um, for a, a person starting out in the Han industry. Uh, what would probably be, be your uh, number one piece of advice to give to somebody like a newbie? <clears throat> 
the, the two hardest pieces of the puzzle to put together when you're starting an event is money and location. And as hard as money is to, to, to lock down, location is even harder. So you really, and you're really kind of dead in the water until you, until you have both of those things. I mean, you can do a business plan, you can do an estimate about what the, the, the by square footage, you know, what you're going to have as far as costs for your haunt. But, but location is definitely the hardest thing to find. So that's really, and, and it's, you know, it's location, location, location. It's the, it's the most important piece of the puzzle too. So, um, so that's the hard part is finding the location. The most, the, the failure, the, the, the way that I see people, the, the most often mistake made is not having enough funding. And I did the exact same thing. I mean, when I started, I just, I had, you know, with very little money. I didn't put enough money into the advertising to drive the numbers that I needed, you know, and then at the end of the season, I was, I was underwater. So it, you, you know, it, it's, and I've done, and I'm no, I've done this so many times in, in, in different businesses, even, you know, you, you do everything that it takes, whatever it takes, you know, mortgage your grandmother, whatever it takes to get that thing open, you know, and then it's open. Great. You make it through the season. You didn't do quite as well as you'd hope. You haven't paid everything off. You know, and now you're looking at trying to figure out how to make it to year two. That's the biggest failure. You have to have you have to have enough money to get open, but you also have to have enough money to make it to year two. That means either rent or storage, you know, on your stuff, you know, and if and that's where that's where most haunts fail. Most haunts fail because they didn't make enough money in the first year to get to year two. So the only their only option is to liquidate and sell everything off and then try to do it again the following year. Um, so being underfunded is the biggest mistake that people make. And I've done that multiple times with multiple, multiple businesses. You know, you, you get going, you're okay. If you could just do a few more people, if you just cut your costs a little bit, if you could just make a little bit more money, you're great. And you're going along and you're getting better, you know, it's, it's doing okay. And then something happens like, you know, it rains every Saturday in October or, you know, you lose your location or they, or they uh, suddenly start doing, you know, road work right in front of your building. So nobody can even find you. It's like you get to you. And it, and because you were on, you were going on this shoestring profit or no profit at all for so long, it just snaps your back. You know, you can't go to a, to a bank and say, look, you know, we have all this invested. We've been making this much money profit every year. You know, I need to, I need to borrow a loan against this, this, these future, uh, this future income so that I can keep going. They, the bank won't do it. I mean, if, if you, so when you do your business plan, when you get to the bottom of the business plan, if it does not say obscene profits at the bottom of the business plan, then rework the plan, you know, throw some, throw more money at advertising, you know, add a haunt so that you can charge more, do something to make that bottom line absolutely profitable. Um, because if you don't, you're, you know, something is going to pop up and it's going to kill you. Very cool advice. Now, uh, Going back to HauntCon a little bit, and, you know, a lot of people, and myself included, you know, we, we love HauntCon and what it, what it is and what it's become, but every convention or trade show out there throughout the year has a costume party, but they don't have a Leonard Pickle costume party. <laughs> now, that is the costume party to end all costume parties. I'm sorry. No other one, no other convention can can hold a candle to your costume party. We do know how year. to throw a party. We do know how to throw a party and drink. That that is absolutely true. <laughs> and what's cool about what's cool about you know now that we've sold the haunt to, to Halloween and Party Expo people, right. you know it's free now. I mean, we used to have we used to try, have to charge sixty bucks for that thing just to cover the food and the space and the DJ and everything. But now the Hong Kong one now is free. I mean, as long as you as long as you've uh, purchased something to get into the show you're you're invited to the to the party and and it's it, and it has a bunch of halloween party expo people as well as the haunt as the haunt people so yeah it is it is quite the party you know, yeah you and, but that right. yeah, not only that but you know i went to the one in in pittsburgh and, and I, I went to the one in new orleans a couple of years ago and it's like for for three hours in new orleans open bar right and haunters yeah. open bar and haunters it's done right i mean <laughs> yeah you and, know. and the food the food that it provided was so much better than some of the others 
I mean, well, good. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, it was, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely, you know, it's, you know, and one of the, and the reason that we did that, I mean, we actually started doing a, a costume party at trans world back when it was in Chicago, we would do haunted attraction magazine would do it, would do its own party, its own costume party long before trans world was doing anything to help the, to do with the haunters at all. And, and um, you know, the whole idea behind that was to, to, to get back to, to what you, you know, why you love Halloween in the first place, you know, getting in costume and scaring people is, is, is what, uh, what got us all started doing this, most of us anyway. And, and, uh, and that's why we used to do the costume party was in, to allow people to get in costume, show off their stuff um, and do a, you know, and hang out and, and, and have a good time uh, in costume. And, and all, when we were moving Hong Kong around every year, it was no, they were notorious for putting, you know, some African-American wedding directly across or some or some Baptist revival or something right across the hallway from where the costume <laughs> hall so it, it made for some interesting um, mixing of, of uh, you know people but, uh, um, but yeah I mean it, it's it's that's something that we've always been always tried to do is to, to remind people why they why they got started in the first place and it was you know getting dressed up and scaring the crap out of people and and uh, so it gives you an opportunity to, to do that I mean we're all working on Halloween we're all working so it makes it hard for, for most of us to do any of that kind of stuff. And, and the, and the party gives you an opportunity to, to do it and, and uh, do it with other people that like-minded people that love doing it too. Oh, absolutely. It was always, you know, amazing costumes and, and just a great camaraderie. Um, and what, what's more fun than a bunch of drunk hoppers? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> um, so, now that you've sold it to Halloween and Party Expo, uh, and I know it's still going, and a matter of fact, they told me they're doubling the size of it. Uh, what capacity of a, or what are you still, are you still consulting with them? Or? Yeah, yeah, we, we still, we still help them out. Um, I think we have one more year on our contract, so it'll be interesting to see what our involvement will be um, after this year, but, but we'll always support Hong Kong. I mean, we're, it was kind of our baby where, you know, it's, and it's always kind of hard to, to, to see that, you know, that daughter go out on the date, you know, and, and get married and not come back. But, but it, um, um, you know, at least they know what the heck they're doing. I mean, we, our biggest problem was trying to, was doing sales, getting, getting the vendors in. And that's still a real struggle. It's early October, you know, it's January is early in the season. It's a long way from October. And it, it, um, that's the, that's the difficult part. You know, and the reason we, we moved it, it the, the Hong Kong used to be in, in April, May, uh, right on that, that junction. And, and the problem was that the vendors that did really poorly at Hong Kong, at, at Transworld, couldn't afford to go to Hong Kong. And the ones that did really well didn't need to go to Hong Kong. So I moved it from being, you know, after Transworld to being before Transworld, hoping that that would give people, you know, kind of a pre-show opportunity, show off what they're thinking about, the vendors show off what they're thinking about doing you know, for, uh, for trans world, as well as, as, um, you know, give people an opportunity to, to order something and pick it up at trans world. Um, because it, it just didn't seem like it was working right after, uh, for as the next show after, after trans world, we just couldn't get the vendors that we wanted. Um, but, uh, so yeah, moving it, you know, it, it's a hard sell because it's early in the year. Uh, but that's when people are starting to think about, you know, what they're, what they're going to change and, and what they're going to do different about their haunts. So it's a, uh, it's a great early op learning opportunity to, to get together with like-minded people and get some education and see some new products. We've got several new vendors that are, that are going to be at the show this year and uh, we're looking forward to it. Well, I know that uh, it being in NOLA, it, it, it's attracted people. I mean, I had never been to New Orleans before I went. And some people want to go just for the experience of New Orleans and Bourbon Street, right. which is an experience in itself. Um, but this is the last year that it's going to be in New Orleans. Right. Yeah. And I moving, believe it's the show's going to moving to Dallas. Dallas, right. right. Next year. Yeah, in 2021, it'll be in Dallas. And it's, that'll be huge because there are so many haunts to tour in Dallas. Right. And so much, there's such a large haunt community in Texas to begin with that 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 yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's going to at least double in size, I would think between 20 and 21. So, um, and that was one thing that was really cool about Hong Kong is the, our ability to move from place to place. But now that it's locked with Halloween and party expo, that, that moving around is going to be harder to do. Sure. But picking Dallas as a location as the next location is going to be perfect because there are so many haunted houses there 
that, you know, we can just pick a direction and go out and see a bunch and come back. And next year we'll pick another direction and go out and come see a bunch and come back. So, so that's going to be a big boon for it. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to that, to that move. It's, uh, it's going to be exciting. And you might see Alan Hops creeping around there someplace. <laughs> yeah, he actually comes to Hong Kong pretty regularly. He uh, does. His, his, uh, um, the, the woman that owns his event is, uh, it loves to go to conventions, so she she comes and brings brings a crew. Typically, I know Alan was there last year. I think he's coming this year too, but sure. uh, he can't allow me to that. But um, but yeah, no, he's um, and Alan's a great guy. You know, I've known him for a long time. It's it's interesting. Our our paths crossed, but we didn't really meet until until he uh, um, really kind of showed up at at um, a dark hour there. And uh, but what a what a character. What a what a great guy. Uh, you know what a lover of the industry and of Halloween and haunting it's it's amazing you know I, I still watch some of his videos every once in a while I run across something and, and uh, watch one of his videos and you know gosh I wish I'd have done that I wish I'd have started doing videos way back that would have been that would have been crazy but uh, but yeah no we love Alan Alan's a good good man I've known him for years and you know, he stays busy. I don't know how he does it all sometimes. He's right. He's got he's his videos talent. every Wednesday and right. And he's now he's got uh classes that people so he sells out classes just right. like that, you know. Yeah. So, one year at one year at Hong Kong, uh Alan did a did a three part class to where the first part that you came in the first day and you sculpted a mask on a on a uh, on a bust and then the next day you molded it. You put it in the mold uh, and made a mold of it. Later that day, you popped the mold, um, cleaned it out, and then on the la on the third day of the show, you poured you poured a latex mask. So so you started off with day one with nothing, and at the end of the day, um, you had this incredible you know mask that you painted, you know in the afternoon. So you had the opportunity to you know to learn how to build a mask from scratch all in one weekend. And and he I bumped into him. Um, the night um, before, a, a, after the after the every, all the whole class had sculpted, I was going someplace and I saw him sitting over there in the booth with all the, those masks. And I went over and, and to to say hello and see what he was doing. He was going through and putting some little details, you know, some and, and fixing stuff on everybody's on everybody's sculpt. So not only you know not only was he giving these people a you know a class on how to do this, he was making sure that when those things went into the mold and came out as latex, that they were going to be gorgeous, you know, and that's just the kind of guy he is. I mean, he really is a, really is a talent and really is a nice guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's, some, you, know, there's, there's I, you know, I used to say I could, I could count the guys in the haunted house, the people in the haunted house industry that I didn't count that I could didn't trust. I used to say I could count those on one hand. You know, it might be both hands and a foot now, but, but still, I mean, the majority of the haunted house people are, are the best people on earth. I mean, they, they will share, they will, you know, give you the shirt off their backs in many cases. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, I guess we get all our inhibitions and, and, and neuroses and whatever anxiety out by scaring the crap out of people because the haunted house, haunted house industry is the, is the best people on earth. Well, I, I can say from experience that, uh, working in haunted houses and, and even with my acting troupe, getting out there and scaring people is great therapy. <laughs> it really is um it's helped me and you know my i still i unfortunately i'm not at the point where i could just do haunting 24 and 7 365 i have a day job right. like most most haunters do uh and you know i take all the frustrations from that day job and i throw it into scaring the hell out of somebody right and that's part of the reason why i got into this business um phenomenal business it is and Leonard, you you have just been at the forefront of this. Uh, I've heard your name for years in this business. And uh, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, Donnie, do you have any final questions for Leonard? Um, yeah, I have two, actually. Um, first one is, I mean, like I said, everybody in the haunted industry knows who Leonard is. He's done so many things. And uh, the yeah, he's even been on Travel Channel. He's done stuff like that. He's, I'm sure he's done publicized in some kind of writings numerous times i'd imagine 
And, uh, but the one thing that I thought was fascinating is I found out that you were actually a, the answer to a trivia question on trivial pursuit game. And I thought that was like very cool. So how, what did you think about that when you found out that you were going to be in a board game? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't believe it. And, and they didn't ask, they didn't ask my permission. They just did it. I, I had some guy, I had some guy walk up to me in a convention one time and he said, did you know that you're a, uh, a, um, uh, a trivial pursuit question? And I said, what? I said, yeah, I was playing trivial, uh, trivial pursuit with these people one night and the guy flips up this card and he asks me, what kind of houses does Leonard Pickle build for amusement parks around the country? And he says haunted houses, and they all looked at him like, "How did you know that?" Because I know Leonard Pickle. Is this like? And I said, "No, you're full of it. There's no way." And he says, "No, no, 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 no. I, I, I swear." And and he actually went and found the set, and pulled the card out, and and uh, he just sent me a photograph of it. I think, and and of course, my mother had to run out and buy the edition. <laughs> she has a, she has the card there someplace, but. Uh, yeah, they didn't even ask. Um, it, that was really kind of it was just like, what? <laughs> there was another time that, too, that th this woman calls me up and she said, and she's asking me a bunch of questions about the haunted house industry. And I'm answering them the questions. And she said, well, um, the reason I'm asking is because I'm writing a, a uh, romance novel. And the girl in the romance novel is uh, a haunted house designer. And, you know, so... Uh, so you, I'm, I'm doing research on, on haunted house designers for this book. And I says, Oh, that's cool. And, um, and again, I, you know, so I just answered her questions and you know, went through my normal spiel and never thought anything about it again. And then I had somebody contact me and said, did you know, have you heard of this, this book? I can't even remember haunted, haunted romance or something. I, something, I don't remember what the name of it was, but it was a Harlequin book. And sure enough, it even had a little note to me inside the book of, of helping the girl out with the, with the concept. And it was so weird, too, because I'm reading this romance novel, which I never have would have ever dreamed. Of. <laughs> and I'm and I'm hearing my words come out of this girl's mouth. It was pretty funny. But uh, <laughs> we bought a bunch of those books one year and gave them out for Christmas presents. It's pretty funny. Gave them to everybody in the industry. <laughs> that is really cool. I mean, mm -hmm. Between the you know, book and, and, and Trivo Pursuit, that just, you know, how how would you have felt if you were actually playing Trivial Pursuit? And my and name you didn't came know up. about it, your name came <laughs> up. I mean. uh, yeah, that would have been funny. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, the things you learn, you know. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, it's just, I've been doing this, for, I mean, they call me, the, people say that I'm the, or I've been called the godfather of haunted house industry. It's just like, you know, I think they're just calling me old, to be honest, because <laughs> um, I've been doing it for forever. It's, you know, I'm, I'm at least, I did my first in 76. I don't know what that, you know, it's over 40 years now, 45, I guess. And, uh, you know, it's just something that I've been doing for so long that, that I couldn't imagine doing anything else. And, and I still love doing it. So it's, it's, you know, and you just, when you've been around this long, you, you know, you're, you pick up stuff, you, you, you're the first to do things just because, just because you started earlier than everybody else does not, not because I'm smarter or more talented, I don't think, but, but uh, just because I've, I've got more, more miles under my belt. To, uh, it's it's the experience. What? It's the experience. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what I sell to my clients. People that come to me that want to do a haunt. They say, we're, we're thinking about doing this. And it's just like, Nope, I did that once. It didn't work. I said, surely it should work. I'll do it again. It didn't work the second time. And then I looked at it and I said, you know what? That was probably a bad idea to begin with. So I steer people away from the potholes as much as I steer them to the direction that they should be going. Because oh. I made all those mistakes at least once and probably twice because I was too stubborn to realize it was a mistake the first time. So uh, and, and that's what I sell. And people that, that contact you should pay heed to that because you've been there. But they don't. That's what's funny. It's, it's so funny. You know, I'm a consultant. I, you know, I can't hold a gun to your head and make you do, you know, what, what I suggest. And, and I have so many clients that just say, well, yeah, we understand what you're saying, but we're going to do it this way. It's just like, okay, well, if you're going to do it that way, here's what you need to do to make sure that you can, that you can handle that or do that. It makes sense to do. Um, but it, it amazes me that how, you know, you're, you're, you're paying me this money, you know, quite a bit of money to, to, to give you my, my thoughts on this. And for you to just say, yeah, that's good, but we're going to do it the way we want to do it anyway. It's your show, so you can do whatever you want to. I can't, I'm, like I said, I can't put a gun to your head, but, 
but, uh, and you know, it's, it's funny to hear uh, the client come back later and say, you know, that thing that you told us not to do and we did anyway. Yeah. It was a mistake. I said, I know I told you that the first time. (laughs) One of my biggest, one of my biggest peeves right now is, is, is um, screw head types. You know, people are trying to use these square tips and the star tips and all these other different kinds of screw tips. And it's just like, I don't care. I don't care which one you use as long as there's only one on the job site, because as soon as you have a, two different kinds of screw heads on the job site, you will never have the right tip in your, in your, in your drill. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to wreck your time. You're just never going to be able to do it. Right. It's, gonna, it's just going to be a mess. And, and I had a guy, Oh no, 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 no. We're just going to have one kind of screw tip. Uh, but we're going to use this, use the star. And it's like, you know, again, all I'm saying is that I just want there to be one on the job site because I get sick and tired of hunting down a tip because you have the wrong tip. And, you know, sure enough, it was, a, he had purchased a used unit that was all done with Phillips. <laughs> they, they had to, they laid ply. It was on, it was on grade. It was on grass. So we had to lay plywood down. The guys that laid the plywood down used the square bit because, you know, that the, the deck screws come with that square, uh, the square tip. Right. Because they lock, because they're, they drive harder. And then he was trying to put everything together with the, with the star bit. So not only did we not more have more, have more than one bit, we had three kinds of bits that we were having to deal with through that whole project. And it was a freaking nightmare. And uh, he came back to me later and he says, remember when you said we should all use the same tip? I said, yeah. So that would have been a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> all I can do is suggest. Right, which that, that kind of leads to my second question. I mean, we've talked about it and touched on it, but we really haven't uh, discussed your your business that you have for that. Um, when with me still learning haunting and stuff, I'm starting to realize that, which I already have realized that I enjoy set building, set design, like being in the haunted house or in the haunted trail building stuff, probably more, if not just as much as I do actually haunting and scaring people. Right. And, uh, and that's pretty much, like I said earlier, that's your bread and butter is you have a haunted house design firm, consulting firm called entrepreneurs. And uh, you just want to tell tell people out there a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it's entrepreneurs.com. Um, it's, um, you know, there's a lot of free information, a lot of articles and that kind of stuff on the website. So that you can go there and kind of get my thoughts on on uh, on what a successful event looks like. And uh, I think there's an article on, on increasing your throughput. And, you know, and Halloween falls on a Saturday this year. So I'm going to start trying to do seminars. I'm not doing one of the Hon- at Hong Kong because I already locked those in. But um start doing uh, seminars on, uh, you know, how to increase your capacity, how to, how to make push more people through because because Saturday on Halloween is going to be massive. And oh, yeah. you really have to think about how you're going to handle those kind of numbers when they show up on Halloween night. Um, you know, we've all, we've said that, that to be able to do 20,000 people through a haunted house, which is where we would like to see people target because it's, that's 20,000 people is where we see people that are really making money. So to, and to do that, you have to be able to run 700 people an hour through your haunted house. And if you can't hit that 700 people an hour, you're not going to need it for long. You only may need it a, a, you know, two or three hours a night for two or three nights. But if you can't hit that number, you're never going to, you're going to have long waits. And it doesn't matter how cool your haunted house is. If people are waiting two or three hours in line, they're not going to be happy. So, uh, so you really need to think about how we're going to, how you're going to uh, handle those crowds, uh, in 2020 because they're going to be big no doubt yeah but yeah it's it's, it's just the website i mean we i do consulting um, hourly uh we write business plans we do feasibility studies we do you know design and development as well as working drawings we can do a permit set for your show and you can bring your ideas to us and we can put we can put all that into a into a, um, a, a design or you know we can and of course we've got our our standard We've got a, I've got a listing of about 250 different room designs that we, that I pull from when I do a design. And to me, a haunted house is a movie that you walk from scene to scene. So we start with a storyline, you know, you know, what kind of evil is it that, that dwells in this structure? You know, what kind of minions is it created? Um, you know, and, and kind of, uh, we don't really draw up a storyboard, but more verbal written storyboard, but, but you know what, we're trying to tell you a story, you know, so it has a beginning, a middle and an end. And uh, you know you have to get that through and through the storyline and and to be honest, and people say, oh, people don't care anything about that, and that's probably true. But if but they'll they will notice the difference. You know, when you have a haunted house that is uh, you know like Dent Schoolhouse, 
Uh, it's Dead Schoolhouse is, is, a, is a haunt that's designed around a 1950s um, schoolhouse. Right. So there's nothing in that building that was built after, you know, 1955 or so. So, so everything that you see as you're walking through is all taken from that time period. You know, and even though you never, you're never going to notice that if that's something that was done in the '60s or, 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 or you know, or something, but your your mind's eye sees it, and your mind's eye, uh, you know, puts all that stuff together, and, and it uh, it uh, makes everything seem more real. It allows you to sus- suspend your disbelief, so that you can feel like you're actually in that in that environment. And once you get them to that point, once they've suspended their belief and they believe that they're in that old schoolhouse now you can scare them easier. Now you have the ability to, to scare people. So I always start with a storyline um, to create uh, the atmosphere and what, uh, and the setting, um, you know, what kind of come up with an evil. And, and I, the other thing I put in my de- uh, try to put in my uh, storylines is, okay, we know this is a haunted house. We know it's scary. Why are we going in as patrons? You know, is, are we doing, going in as a, a cleanup crew? Or are we searching for, you know, missing minors or something? I mean, we get to give the people a reason for them to go through and that but that storyline is as much for the designer as it is for the as it is to put on your website and push people to your haunt you know because that keeps the designer from going to a, to a trade show and buying this really cool frankenstein animatronic and this really cool um you know freddy krueger animatronic or something and try to put those both into the same haunted house um it, it gives you a map you know starting from point a and going to point going to point b you know, and, and it keeps the designer and the crew on the same pathway to make sure everybody kind of, kind of knows where we're going and, you know, keeps it from, from having a kind of a shotgun approach of clowns in one room and, and, um, you know, Freddie in the next room. Well, I can't, I can't agree with you more about the dent schoolhouse. I actually spent four years working at the dent schoolhouse. Yeah. Great guy. uh, It's a, the detail is amazing in that haunt, uh, along with the old building. So it, it's uh, it's it, it, it's earned its spot at the top of the lists. Sure, absolutely. Um, so let's. Uh, people want to find out more about Leonard Pickle, about entrepreneurs. What kind of social media? Let's do all that. Uh, let's do the plugs. As just we, as just Google me. I show up like a rash. <laughs> You know, it's, it's P-I-C-K-E-L, which some people miss, but so my last name is spelled wrong, but uh, yeah, entrepreneurs.com or Leonard Pickle on, on uh, social media. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I come up just about everywhere, but um, and mostly I do Facebook and, and uh, of course a website, but, uh, uh, but yeah, no, we've, and we're, we're working hard to, to come up with, a, we're trying to write a couple of books. Um, one of them would be Room Design Ideas. So there'll be an illustrated thing of different kind of room designs. It'll be about 60 room designs in the set. Uh, we're trying to come out with that book this year. Uh, I've also got a how to get started book and a, and a how to make money, uh, both of which uh, I think is something that's needed in the industry. So I know three books I'll be buying here. <laughs> yeah, I got them written. It's, it's, yeah. it's Con is right around the corner. I really like to have them for Hong Kong. So we're, we're pushing hard to, to get that finished, but uh uh, it's something I've been needed to do for a long time. I need to, I need to start selling my brain instead of my back. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm hoping that I can some share some stuff, uh, uh, make a little money on it and, and, uh, help. And again, you know, it's all about sharing. It's all about sharing information and, uh, helping other people. Well, Leonard, thank you so much for being here on wrestle horror. And you know what, Donnie, we didn't ask him one last question. Who's oh, your yeah. Who's your favorite wrestler? <laughs> Mad Dog Murphy. Mad Dog Murphy. Okay. He was, he was a, when, when I was young, um, in, uh, in high school or even maybe, even maybe a little below that, I would stay up late nights, uh, working on tank models. I used to, I used to be model builder and I'd, I'd build, uh, World War II tanks and, uh, that, and wrestling was on and I, and I would just watch it constantly. I mean, it was just always on TV and, and this guy named Mad Dog Murphy was, was, he, he was always kind of growling. He was always, he was always mouthing or growling at something. And, <laughs> and he was incredible. I, I don't watch wrestling anymore, but, but when I did, he, he was the king as far as I was concerned. Okay. Yeah, Mad so Dog Murphy. Murphy. 
Yeah, you know, one of my favorites was Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer. That's who I thought you was going to get ready to say. Sorry, I was like, I think we just became best friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a little before your time, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, you're not that much older than us. Uh, <laughs> but uh, feels like it sometimes. <laughs> Leonard, thanks again for taking time to come on to Wrestle Horror and talk about. My pleasure haunted attractions and Hong Kong and everything you do. It's been a really fun interview and I think people are going to get a lot out of this. So uh, until I then, so. I hope that uh, if you're listening, you get to go to Hong Kong. Um, I'm sure Leonard will be there. Doing several seminars. Yep. Uh, there you go. So, you know, take the classes, listen to this man. He knows what he's doing. Uh, did you have plans to come back to the Ohio Halloween and Haunters uh, convention this year? Uh, they haven't invited me back yet. I'd love to go. Um, they're going to do it back in, in the prison again, aren't they? Yeah. 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 And I guess they're opening up the other side, too, so there's going to be more space. Right. Good. No, we, I, I support all the conventions. It does. I mean, yeah, we do Hong Kong, but, but, uh, but I'll speak at anything that'll let me, you know. So it's, again, it's all about sharing, and, and uh, we support all the, all the shows. There are very few of them that I <laughs> that I haven't been to at least if not spoken at. So, so I'm always looking for, looking for new ears and trying to help people out. I'll, I'll rattle a cage up at, uh, there you go. <laughs> um, again, Dinner's on us again. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Leonard, thank you so much. Listeners <laughs> pay attention. Absolutely. Learn, uh, for a wrestle horror podcast. I'm, J I'm meet up Jim, Jim Millspaw. What are you going to call me? Donnie Hoover. And our special guest, Leonard Pickle, have a great night, and we'll see you on the next show. See you. Thanks for listening. Make sure you follow us on all, all of our social media outlets, Facebook.com backslash Russell Horror, Instagram at Russell Horror, Twitter at Russell Horror, on our YouTube channel, the Russell Horror Channel. Also, you can find us at www.russellhorror.com. Yeah.